This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. This is the second episode in the series Falling Stars, where I detail cases involving up-and-coming social media stars. This week, I'll tell you about a rising singing star who began her career on YouTube before making it to Hollywood to compete on a nationally televised talent show. Christina Grimmie had a bright future ahead of her as an entertainer in 2016 when an obsessed fan cut her career short when he committed an unprovoked act of violence. This is chapter two of Falling Stars, YouTube star Christina Grimmie. If I asked you right now to name one person you're a fan of, who would it be? Most of us have a person who in reality is a stranger, but whom we admire and consider special. Maybe we admire them for their talent as an actor, singer, or musician. Or perhaps it's for their leadership qualities or because they are a passionate activist. Or let's be honest, we could simply like their personality or the way they look. I myself am a big fan of James Hetfield, lead singer and guitarist for Metallica. I admired him for his talent, but also because, well, he's super hot. For most of us, it's just fun to follow a celebrity or famous person and maybe even daydream about what it would be like to meet them, have a conversation, or even become friends. It's just a fun fantasy to contemplate while sitting in traffic or doing the laundry. But it's a harmless enough momentary escape from our day-to-day -day reality. Although, I'm optimistic that if James and I met, we'd become fast friends. So James, if you're listening, call me. Anyway, back to reality. And for some, that's more of a problem than you'd think. Some take the dream of knowing those they admire and consider themselves fans of and become obsessed with them. It's become so common and increasingly problematic that several terms have even emerged to describe this phenomenon. These people are sometimes called superfans. This sounds innocent enough, but even the term fan is derived from the word fanatic. Another term that has gained popularity in the last few years is stan. The definition of stan is a person who has developed an unhealthy attachment to a celebrity. Stans may feel a sense of entitlement or ownership over the star, which fuels toxic behavior, including invading the celebrity's privacy by trespassing on property, sending a barrage of unwanted messages via email, letters, etc., and seeking to gain access to them, their families, or loved ones. There is a debate on how the term stan originated. Some say it's a combination of the words fan and stalker, while others say it's derived from rapper Eminem's song Stan, which tells the story of a crazed fan. Stans have been known to attack people they believe have disrespected their celebrity crushes online. They can even become violent against non-fans or even the celebrities themselves if they feel they're being ignored. Mental health and law enforcement agencies have coined other terms for obsessed fan behavior. Stalking, obsessive addictive disorder, and parasocial relationships. Parasocial relationships, or one-sided non-reciprocal relationships, are characterized by an all-consuming admiration for a celebrity or other public figure that is obsessive, compulsive, and addictive. Those who exhibit this behavior reject or abandon real relationships and instead spend time following their celebrity crushes online or in some other way pursuing the person they have become obsessed with. This behavior crosses the line into a disorder when the time spent on these activities disrupt their home lives, jobs, or careers, and relationships with family and friends suffer or are ignored altogether. These obsessed fans may also experience financial problems by losing time off work to follow the celebrity or spending money beyond their means to secure things like pricey VIP tickets, to get up close and personal with their crush, travel to follow them to their next event, or even pay for cosmetic surgery in the hopes of appealing to the celebrity or even to alter their appearance to look like them. But obsessive fan behavior can become toxic for the fan and the celebrity 
when the insistence on gaining proximity crosses a line into harassment, stalking, invasion of privacy, threats, or other problematic and inappropriate attempts to interact. Issues contributing to obsessive fan behavior are certain mental health conditions such as depression and anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, borderline personality disorder, and schizoaffective disorder. Other traits contributed to this phenomenon are people prone to living in fantasy rather than reality, low self-esteem, dissatisfaction with life, poor relationship skills, and obsessive internet use. One other contributing factor that jumps out at me is the increased access to celebrities due to social media. Actors, musicians, sports figures, politicians, and others post behind-the-scenes snapshots of their lives on Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and other platforms. In this way, the public has much more information regarding a celebrity's personal life, and that can cause some people with the above personality traits and conditions to believe they are personally connected to them. This can, in turn, lead to an escalation in fan obsession. It can also increase the celebrity's risk, as stalkers can pinpoint the famous person's movements and locations in real time. I found some chilling statistics about this phenomenon while researching this episode. According to PsychCentral.com, as many as 30% of the general public will engage in celebrity worship on a borderline pathological level. 30%. Psychology Today cites research stating that 12 to 16% of women and 7 to 10% of men will be stalked at some point in their lifetime. Cyberstalking and cyberbullying are currently being reported at higher numbers yearly, especially among teens and young adults. Over the years, some obsessed fan behavior has been reported in the media and appears to be rising. Talk show host David Letterman was harassed by one obsessed fan for over a decade. The woman broke into his home several times and was arrested repeatedly, but continued her behavior until she died by suicide. One fan wrote actor Michael J. Fox over 6,000 fan letters and started threatening him and his family with harm after he married his wife and they began having children. Taylor Swift was stalked by a fan who contacted her father and threatened to kill her and her entire family. He was arrested after following her from a concert to the airport. And a fan of actress and singer Selena Gomez broke into her home and was caught and arrested. However, just hours after his release, he returned to her house to continue his stalking behavior. But even more disturbing that fans who make themselves known to celebrities and harass them are the ones who carry on their obsession secretly and only make themselves known to the star once they are out of control and ready to act. I covered cases of celebrities who became victims of these types of obsessed fans in season one of Once Upon a Crime. You can listen to the tragic stories of actors Rebecca Schaefer and Teresa Saldana and musician John Lennon in the Fatal Fans series. Christina Grimmy, an up-and-coming young recording artist, would also become a victim of an undercover obsessed fan. I'll tell you her story right after a short break. Every day, people are reported missing. In big cities and small towns, adults, teens, and children, young and old alike. Fortunately, the vast majority are found within 48 hours. Some who just forgot to tell loved ones they were leaving town, or took a time out from their lives, or for many other reasons. But what about the people who seem to simply vanish, and days, weeks, months, or even years pass without answers? That's a nightmare scenario we all hope we never experience. The Vanished is a podcast that covers unsolved missing persons cases that don't often make it on the radar of mainstream media. Marissa Jones has been researching and presenting these cases for years, with the goal of helping people find missing loved ones or at least find answers. I count Marissa among one of my very first podcast friends, and I'm so proud of her and the good work she's done on The Vanished. The Vanished has even aided in getting long overdue arrests by conducting in-depth interviews with family, friends, law enforcement, and even suspects. Every week, The Vanished covers a new case and reminds listeners of the human behind the headlines. Enjoy The Vanished on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen to The Vanished early and ad-free on Wondery Plus. Join Wondery Plus in the Wondery app or on Apple Podcasts. 
It's been a long, hot summer, my friends, and it shows no signs of letting up soon. While I dig the sunshine, what I don't dig is body odor that may result from being hot and sweaty. And you know, underarms aren't the only place we have odor, so I'm excited to tell you about our new sponsor, Lumi Whole Body Deodorant, that's made to keep you odor-free from armpits to belly buttons to below the belt region. Lumi is a uniquely formulated pH-balanced deodorant that's aluminum-free, skin-safe, and proven to control odor for up to 72 hours. That's amazing. I am in love with this product. Lumi has stick and cream deodorants, odor control body wash, cleansing bars, and deodorant wipes that will keep you odor-free and smelling great all over your body, baby. I love Lumi's acidified body washes that are powered by gentle alpha hydroxy acid to control odor. And they come in amazing scents, like toasted coconut, my summer fave, and clean tangerine. There's also an unscented version. I'm also a big fan of cream deodorants that not only keep you fresh all day, but feel great on the skin. And I'm telling you, stock your shower with Lumi body wash or a cleansing bar, and you won't have to worry about your teen or partner forgetting to apply deodorant. Lumi is the first deodorant of its kind seriously safe to use anywhere on the body, with the safe and effective ingredient, mandelic acid, to stop odor before it starts. And I have a special offer for my listeners. New customers get $5 off Lumi starter pack with code ONCE at lumideodorant.com. Lumi starter pack is a great way to try out a variety of their whole body deodorant products. You'll get a solid stick deodorant, cream tube deodorant, two free products of your choice, like their mini body wash and deodorant wipes, and free shipping. And as a special offer for our listeners, new customers get $5 off a Lumi starter pack with code ONCE at lumideodorant.com. That equates to over 40% off your starter pack when you use lumideodorant.com, that's L-U-M-E, deodorant.com, and use code ONCE. And we thank Lumi for sponsoring this episode. Christina Victoria Grimmie was born in 1994 in Marlton, New Jersey. Her parents were Tina and Albert Grimmie. Christina's brother Marcus, two years older than her, was her best friend. She and Marcus attended Cherokee High School in Marlton. Both Christina and her brother were musically talented. Christina aspired to be an entertainer from an early age. She began recording herself singing popular songs and posting them on YouTube in 2009 when she was just 15. Her first video, posted on July 17, 2009, was a cover of the song Don't Want to Be Torn by Hannah Montana, a.k.a. Miley Cyrus. The video, which can still be viewed on YouTube, is grainy, and her image is blurred, but it's easy to see that Christina, who plays the song on a keyboard while singing along, is quite talented with a strong, clear voice and a natural stage presence. She continued posting herself singing and playing songs by Justin Bieber, Celine Dion, Beyonce, and others, and posting them on her YouTube channel. According to her father, Albert, she was astonished when she began receiving hundreds of likes and positive comments from strangers who had found her channel. In August of the same year, the video of Christina singing Miley Cyrus's Party in the USA went viral, and she began to be recognized by music industry insiders as a promising young talent. She entered the My YouTube competition in 2011 and won second place behind Selena Gomez. Gomez's mother, Mandy Teefy, contacted the teen to help her launch her singing career. Mandy and Brian Teefy, Selena Gomez's parents, became Christina's managers. Christina recorded backup vocals for Selena Gomez and toured with her, opening for her during the We Own the Night tour. 2011 was an important and whirlwind year for the teen singer. Not only did she go on tour as an opening act for one of the most prominent pop singers at that time, but she also released her first single and her first EP. After releasing the EP titled Find Me, Grimmie's YouTube channel surpassed 1 million subscribers. Her song Liar Liar reached number 15 on the U.S. Billboard chart. Christina's success seemed to happen almost overnight, but she remained humble. She explained that it was never her goal to become famous, but only to share her music with others to enjoy. She said she wanted to be considered, quote, an inspirational artist, not to have all the money in the world, end quote. One artist that inspired her, Christina said, was another Christina, Christina Aguilera. Even if she didn't aspire to be famous, Christina quickly gained internet fame. 
By 2013, her YouTube channel had more than 375 million views and over 2 million subscribers, and she had almost a million Twitter followers. Her first studio album, With Love, was released in August of that year. But the accomplishment that would get her recognized by millions more was her appearance on the American televised talent competition, The Voice. She performed Miley Cyrus's Wrecking Ball on February 14, 2014, during the show's blind auditions, and was selected as a contestant for season six. She chose Adam Levine as her coach, and she was also given support and encouragement by Selena Gomez and Justin Bieber, whose songs she had often covered on YouTube. Christina came in third place at the conclusion of the season. Although she was not the winner, she was approached by several record labels who wanted to sign her. She ultimately chose Island Records. Christina joined past winners and runners-up of The Voice on tour for The Voice Summer Tour in 2014. Her first single with the label, Must Be Love, was also released that summer. Christina Grimmie's fame began on YouTube and rose again in front of millions of television viewers. She reported all the exciting developments on her Twitter account, updating her fans every step of the way by posting photos, videos, and messages. Over 3 million fans now followed her on social media. But there was one fan whose attention toward the young singer had become an unhealthy obsession. On June 10, 2016, 27-year-old Kevin James Loebel arrived at the Courtyard by Marriott Hotel in Orlando, Florida. It was about 1.30 p.m. when he approached the front desk clerk to check in. He had no luggage and paid $269 in cash for a one-night stay. The manager later described Loebel as strange. Loebel had traveled from his home in St. Petersburg, Florida, about 100 miles southwest of Orlando. He had tickets to an event that he'd purchased less than a week earlier. He had recently obtained a state-issued driver's learning permit, but had not yet obtained an official driver's license. He also did not own a car. Loibel had taken a cab to St. Petersburg, paying $200 to reach his destination. Loibel could indeed be described as strange. On the outside, he appeared to be a productive member of society, who mostly kept to himself, and mostly stayed out of trouble. But according to the few who interacted with him, Loibel was a bit of an odd duck. At 27, he still lived at home with his father, Paul. He also had an older brother named Chris. His mother, Nora, had passed away after what was ruled as an accidental aspirin overdose in 2010. Loibel didn't spend much time with his father or brother, preferring to go directly into his room when he returned home from work. His father would later say that his son, quote, spent a great deal of time on his computer in his room, and also said that he lived like a hermit. His room also reflected some of Loibel's odd quirks. Complaining of sensitivity to light, he covered his bedroom windows with aluminum foil and heavy blackout curtains. Almost 10 years had passed since he'd graduated from high school, and Loibel was still working at the same part-time job he had been employed at since he was a teen. He worked at the electronics retail store Best Buy as a Geek Squad team member in technical support. He worked in the back of the store and had little interaction with customers. He didn't socialize or even converse very often with his coworkers. His manager described him as socially awkward and detached. Early in 2016, coworkers and others noticed some changes in Loibel. He lost weight, dropping about 50 pounds by committing to a vegan diet. He also had his teeth whitened and underwent LASIK surgery to shed his eyeglasses. His fellow employees at Best Buy had also become aware of his crush on a young singer whose videos he repeatedly watched on YouTube. They good-naturedly teased him about his interest in singer Christina Grimmie. They described Loibel as a loner who never dated, and they assumed he was experiencing his first real interest in a female. They found it innocent enough. But Loibel did have one friend whom he confided in. Corey Dennington had been friends with Kevin Loibel for 15 years. Dennington believed he was Loibel's only friend in the world. Like Loibel's co-workers, Dennington also took note of his friend's infatuation with Christina Grimmy. But the conversations he had with his friend caused Dennington to believe 
that he had become fixated on Grimmy. According to Dennington, Loibel spent, quote, most of his waking hours seeking everything to do with Christina Grimmy on the internet. In addition to obsessively watching her on YouTube, Loibel constantly monitored the singer's social media channels. Loibel himself had no social media presence, no Facebook page, Twitter account, or any other social media accounts. Dennington was surprised upon learning that his friend, who'd always professed to be an atheist, had done a 180 and embraced Christianity. Christina Grimmy was a Christian, and Loibel told Dennington that hearing her talk about her faith had changed him and helped him to see the world differently. Loibel told Dennington that he had, quote, seen God in Christina. Loibel began telling his friend of his plans to meet Grimmy. She was his soulmate, he gushed, and they were destined to be together. As his only friend, Dennington tried to talk some sense into Loibel, who he now believed was unhealthily obsessed with the singer. But Loibel refused to listen when Dennington told him it was unrealistic to believe he and Grimmy would be together. He bristled at the mere suggestion that his plan to meet his crush wouldn't work. Dennington backed off, but shared his concern with their supervisor, Luke Dahl. Dahl had also noticed how often Loibel pulled up Grimmy's YouTube videos on his work computer. On June 5th, Dennington saw his friend for the last time. They were at work, and Loibel returned some magazines he'd borrowed from his friend, saying, I love you, brother. He then said something odd that Dennington didn't understand. Loibel told him he was, quote, tired and ready to ascend. I know that many of my listeners fancy themselves citizen detectives. You turn over the evidence of an unsolved mystery in your mind and try and crack it. Or you find the obvious plot holes in a dramatized murder mystery television show. And maybe you think you'd make a pretty good detective. Well, I've got a fun way for you to test out your sleuthing skills. By playing Relatable's newest game, Who Killed Mia? You know them from their popular party games like What Do You Meme? Who Killed Mia is their first murder mystery game, and you'll be hooked on the immersive and interactive experience while playing. It's centered around a fictional but so true-to-life character, Mia Starr, a social media influencer whose caught-on-camera murder by a masked figure shocks the internet. As you can imagine, there's no shortage of suspects, and it's up to you to solve the case. The game includes digital and physical clues you must research to eliminate or zero in on the likely murderer. This riveting new game is available on the Relatable website and at Target, Walmart, and Amazon. I loved how I was able to follow the case by watching videos, including the crime itself and pulling up digital evidence to answer questions, find clues, and seek to find the killer. And it's super fun to open each packet during your investigation to sift through physical clues and evidence, like police interrogation reports, crime scene photos, maps and diagrams, and more. I play it on my own, and I have to say, so far, I'm doing a pretty good job. You get a green light when you reach the correct conclusion for each question to move you forward on the case. But you could also assemble a team or bring in your partner in crime, solving, and enjoy the game with friends. I didn't want to stop playing once I started. I needed to find out if my detective skills were on point. Who Killed Mia is for all game lovers, but especially those of you who love the challenge of solving a true-to-life murder mystery. Get Who Killed Mia for your next game night and find out who killed the world's favorite influencer. Who Killed Mia, a new kind of murder mystery game from Relatable, the creators of the hit game, What Do You Meme? Get 20% off with promo code ONCE at Relatable.com slash WhoKilledMia. There's a link in the show notes. Don't forget to use my promo code ONCE for 20% off. And we thank Relatable for sponsoring today's show. The same day Loibel last saw his friend, he went on the internet and purchased a ticket to a concert that was to be held at the Plaza Life Theater in Orlando, Florida on June 10th five days later. On the bill was the band Before You Exit and singer Christina Grimmie. On Thursday, June 9th, Loibel left his home in the afternoon in a cab. His father watched him go, but his son did not say where he was headed. Paul Loibel became concerned when Kevin didn't return by Friday afternoon. He called Best Buy and learned his son had not shown up for his shift. Paul called him repeatedly, but his son didn't answer any of his calls. 
about the time his father was growing worried, Kevin Loibel was checking into the courtyard by Marriott in Orlando. He only left his room once to grab some snacks from the lobby snack bar, which he ate once he returned to his room and shut himself in again. That afternoon, Christina Grimmy posted a video on her Twitter feed, inviting people to come out that evening for the show. Hey guys, what's up, she began. We're in Orlando today. Please come to the show if you live near Orlando. We're at the Plaza Live. Please come out. The concert started at 7 p.m. and was scheduled to end by 10. Just before the concert began, Loibel was captured on video at an Old Navy clothing store near the theater. He purchased a black baseball cap and a bottle of water. He put the hat on as he exited the store. He made his way to the Plaza Live Theater and presented his ticket. Bag checks were conducted, but there were no metal detectors, and Loibel was quickly ushered inside. He wore black jeans, a black t-shirt, and a red, blue, and white checkered shirt. About 300 people attended the show that night. Once the performances ended at 10 p.m., Grimmy moved to a table where she would sit to sign autographs and greet fans. Her brother Marcus was seated close by at a merchandise table. Marcus Grimmy traveled with his sister as her road manager while she toured. Loibel stood in line to meet Christina. He approached the table, but didn't say a word. Christina loved to meet fans, but knew that they sometimes became shy and had difficult approaching her to say hello. What happened next took place within mere seconds. Loibel approached Christina, and when he remained quiet, she assumed he was too shy to greet her, so, as was her custom, Christina opened her arms to give him a hug. Loibel pulled out a Glock pistol and fired. Marcus Grimmy saw the man approach his sister and then heard gunshots. He saw Christina fall to the ground, and he instinctively moved towards the shooter. Chaos erupted around them as people began to scream and run away. Marcus grabbed Loibel, but the shooter broke free, backed himself up against a wall, lifted the pistol to his head, and fatally shot himself. Multiple calls to 911 were placed just after 10.20 p.m. When officers arrived, the shooter lay dead on the floor against a wall, and Christina Grimmy lay in a pool of blood. She was rushed to Orlando Regional Medical Center, but at just before 11 p.m., she was pronounced dead. She had been shot three times at close range, in the head and chest. Homicide investigators processed the crime scene at the Plaza Live Theater. They found six 9mm shell casings on the floor. Two Glock handguns were lying next to the dead shooter, who was identified by information found in his wallet as Kevin James Loibel, 27, from St. Petersburg, Florida. He had died instantly from a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. Two holsters that held the weapons had been concealed behind him, clipped into his waistband. The plaid shirt was untucked, hiding them from view. Security guards employed at the theater were unarmed and were not instructed to conduct pat-downs of guests entering the venue. Loibel was also discovered to have two full 9mm magazines in his front pocket and a tactical hunting knife strapped to his ankle. Investigators learned that Loibel had purchased both weapons legally. Each required a five-day waiting period before the purchaser could pick it up. Loibel had bought the first gun on May 31st and the second on June 7th just three days before the shooting. A key card for the Courtyard by Marriott on Magnolia Avenue in Orlando was found in Loibel's wallet. Investigators arrived at the hotel and spoke with the hotel manager. Having already heard about the shooting at the theater, the hotel manager asked detectives if Loibel was a suspect in the Grimmy shooting. He explained that he had a weird vibe from Loibel when he checked in without luggage and paid in cash. After searching his room, Investigators noted that the bed looked as if Loibel had slept on top of the covers. In the room safe, they found a drawstring backpack with toiletries and an empty plastic Glock gun case, which contained more ammunition. While investigators were at the hotel, a scheduled cab arrived for Loibel. The cab driver explained that Loibel had paid him in advance to return the next day to pick him up and drive him home to St. Petersburg. It was clear that he had intended to return home after murdering Christina Grimmy. Detectives questioned Loibel's father, brother, co-workers, and best friend, Corey Dennington. They all denied ever hearing Loibel threaten harm either to himself or Christina Grimmy. 
His father said his son had never mentioned Grimmy to him, and no one knew he'd purchased a ticket to see her live. Paul Loibel gave the detective permission to search his son's room. In a filing cabinet, they found a second plastic Glock case containing spare magazines and ammunition. They found nothing in his room regarding Christina Grimmy. Marcus Grimmy was credited with saving lives by his quick actions. Orlando Police Chief John Minna stated, quote, There were very heroic actions by Marcus Grimmy. It definitely could have prevented further loss of life. End quote. While glad that no one else had been hurt that day, it was a small comfort to Marcus, who had been unable to save his sister, who was also his best friend. Investigators determined that Loibel had no known prior connection to Grimmy. He had encrypted his cell phone so investigators could not extract any data. Loibel, it appears, also intentionally destroyed the hard drive on his computer, preventing investigators from searching it for other clues as to his motive. But it seems likely that Christina Grimmy never communicated with her obsessed fan and had received no threats from Loibel prior to the day he murdered her. Christina's family, Albert Bud Grimmy, Tina Grimmy, and her brother Marcus, were devastated by the loss of Christina. They made a statement while still grappling with the shock of her sudden and tragic death. It read, The outpouring of love and generosity displayed to our family throughout these last few weeks has far exceeded anything we could have ever imagined. As we have always known, Christina's life was so very special, not only to us, but to everyone she touched with her joyful heart beautiful voice, and love for life and the Lord. Words cannot express what the many memorials, donations, and tributes shared by Christina's fans and those in the media and entertainment industry mean to us. She will live on in our hearts forever. We will take our time determining the best ways to honor Christina moving forward. Thank you. Her manager, Brian Teefee, also relayed a message to Christina's fans and supporters. Words cannot begin to describe the pain I am feeling. I learned this business through the eyes of a father, and Christina was like a second daughter to me. All I wanted to do was assist her in achieving her musical dreams, while protecting her from the pitfalls associated with the business. I never could have imagined this horrific event being one of those pitfalls that needed to be avoided. In Christina's honor, I have created a GoFundMe page to assist her family in their time of need. As a family, Mother, father, and brother made the ultimate family sacrifice to support Christina on her musical journey. They did nothing but love and support her as a family, the best they knew how. The only worry I want them to have at this point is that of their recovery. Grimms, I love you and miss you beyond comprehension." End quote. On June 16, 2016, Christina Grimmy was laid to rest in her hometown in New Jersey. The next day, the public was invited to a public memorial. Scores of friends, family, and fans united to say goodbye to the rising star, who shone so brightly and whose light was extinguished so suddenly. It lasted over five hours as many came to grieve, support her family, and say goodbye. Christina's mentor and coach on The Voice, Adam Levine, offered to pay for her services, which touched the family deeply. Truly, everyone their daughter interacted with, however briefly, was touched by her light, energy, and her heart in some way. Christina's family founded the Christina Grimmy Foundation, a nonprofit organization dedicated to supporting families impacted by gun violence. The foundation's website states that 99% of Americans will know a victim of gun violence in their lifetimes, and over 100 lives are lost daily as a result. Donations to the foundation allow victims and their families time to heal and get back on their feet. Cash grants help them to pay for housing, child care, medical expenses, transportation, and travel costs. Since launching in April of 2017, the Christina Grimmy Foundation has given away over $400,000 in support to victims. Those it has helped include victims of the mass shooting in Uvalde, Texas in 2022, which resulted in 21 dead and 17 injured, the supermarket shooting in Buffalo, New York, also in 2022, in which 10 people died, and the bar and grill shooting in Thousand Oaks, California, in 2018, which resulted in 12 dead. On September 2nd this year, 
the foundation is hosting a fundraising concert. The Concert for a Cause, which will take place in Christina's hometown of Marlton, New Jersey, will feature performances by young musical artists. The Grimmy family continues to honor Christina's memory by supporting other rising stars to reach their dreams. Her brother Marcus will also perform. Christina's mother Tina kept her daughter's memory alive through the foundation and as a spokesperson advocating to save other young people from becoming victims of random gun violence. The September 2nd Concert for a Cause will also honor Tina Grimmie, who passed away on September 2nd, 2018, after a battle with breast cancer. If you'd like more information on the foundation or to donate, go to ChristinaGrimmieFoundation.org. There's a link in the show notes. That will do it for this episode of Once Upon a Crime. Once Upon a Crime is written and produced by me, Esther Sanchez Ludlow. My production assistant is Lorena Garcia, and research for this episode was provided by Emma Battaglia. I'll be back next week with another chapter in the series, Falling Stars, and I hope you'll join me then. For bonus episodes, ad-free episodes, and other special perks, become a member of our Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash onceuponacrime to find out more and join. Until next time, be good to one another.